joining us for today's presentation by Professor Elizabeth Heinemann. She's Professor of History and of Gender, Women's, and Sexuality Studies at the University of Iowa. She'll be speaking to us today on Europe's Radical Right. So I'm Bill Reisinger, a member of the Board of Directors of the ICFRC, and I'll be host for today's program. Uh, I want to start out by thanking our members, volunteers, and interns for their ongoing efforts, uh, without which we couldn't have these forums. And also on behalf of ICFRC, I thank our university and community supporters, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, the U of I Public Policy Center, international programs, as well as the Stanley U of I Foundation Support Organization for their financial support. Uh, we are also very grateful to today's special sponsors, Alan Swanson, Blank and McCune Realty, and Maureen Braddock. Okay, uh, let me uh, now turn to introducing our speaker. Uh, Professor Heinemann has been at the University of Iowa since 1999. She teaches courses on Germany, Europe, gender, and human rights. Her study of gender issues in the German and broader European context give her a distinct and valuable perspective on far-right ideology and organizing. Uh, she has spent substantial time, uh, five or more years, uh, doing field work in Germany and other parts of Europe. Uh, she received her PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 1993. She is the 2010 recipient of the AICGS DAAD Prize for Distinguished Scholarship in German and European Studies, and the 2011 recipient of the New Millennium Writing Award in Nonfiction. So uh, please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Heinemann. Thank you very much for the introduction. And um, it's always a real pleasure to speak to this group. Um, I was a little disoriented when I came in today. I'm used to being over there where Janice is. Um, but I was glad to see there's still little plates of peppermint patties, <laughs> which after the audience are the best thing about these speaking gigs. Um, I'm hoping that we can dim the lights here so we have slightly better contrast um, for the visuals. Um, I'm going to, in fact, I'm going to start oh, other way around. Does that work for you? Is that too dark? Is that okay? It just it's, it makes it a little easier to see what's going on here. So obviously the the, the rise of the far right um, in Europe as as and elsewhere in the world is is much in the news today. And I wanted to start us out actually with just a quick slide um, with, with, that shows us some. Um, Electoral strength in the most recent elections, these are actually two different reports, one from the BBC, one from Statista, um, both from November of 2019, though, very recent. Um, and actually, I'm a teacher. I'm going to ask you to participate. Um, I wonder if anybody wants to sort of take a look at what's up here and, and, and make any observations about, about what you're seeing in these slides, and I'll repeat the answers so they could be picked up. Any observations? The contrast is not so good. Okay, I apologize for those of you. Yeah, somebody, somebody shouted out Poland. What do you want to say about Poland? Yeah. But, but, you know, Poland, it's an interesting thing going on, right? Poland is number 17 for those of you for whom these little maps are hard. Um, and Poland in the map on the left actually looks, looks pretty good, only 1% to 8%. Um, you know, far right or nationalist representation in the last election. On the right-hand thing, we got Poland looking pretty awful, right? 43.6%. Um, it, it's a striking thing about these two reports, clearly drawing on the same data, uh, which brings us to probably <laughs> the first and, and one, a, a very crucial point in talking about the subject, is, which is basically figuring out how to even categorize different political parties, because that's basically what's going on here. Um, the report on the right categorizes law, the law and justice party, the, the dominant party in Poland in that category, and thus we get 43 plus percent. The one on the left, here it is with the actual, I, I realize this is small, number 17, Poland. Um, they draw only on what's called the confederation, which ends up with a little bit more than 6%. So clearly there's a, a question about what even goes in that category. So I want to talk a little bit first just about, about terminology and definitions. Um, you know, I, I titled this course, uh, this, this, <laughs> this, this talk, Europe's Radical Right. But, you know, you, you'll read reports about the hard right, the ultra right, the extreme right, the far right, the radical right. Um, and, and a lot of that is we know that there's something very, very right 
on the right end of the, the political spectrum. But, um, you know, there, there's no industry standard for terminology here. Um, a lot of it is just very vernacular. Something seems extreme, so we call it extreme. And what does extreme mean? Maybe it means they're willing to use violence. Maybe they mean they use fascist symbols. Or what does it mean exactly? Maybe it means the actual programs are extreme by some measure. Um, so, so the reality is there's a lot of sort of, you know, People, people use these terms. Um, various sort of social scientists and, um, have sort of do, di, dived in and try to, to give slightly more precise definitions. Their definitions are basically for the purpose of the essay, for the purpose of this book, but again, there's not an industry standard here. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to talk a little bit about that, and I'm going to, you know, for the purpose of this lecture, I will give some definitions. The, the other thing I want to draw your attention to real quickly, this is just, and I'll read this for you because I realize this is ridiculously small, electoral volatility. Um, this is just a graph of far-right parties in 2019 national elections compared to whenever the previous election was in several countries, Estonia, Finland, Austria, Spain, Belgium, Denmark, Poland, and Greece. Again, any observations? <clears throat> Anything that jumps out at you about this? Estonia is making sense. Estonia, okay, Estonia is growing, right, from the previous election, you know, doubling its representation. We have other places that are shrinking, notably. Take a look at Denmark, from 21% down to 8.7. We've got other places, you know, the Finns party in Finland that are staying basically the same. Um, so it, it's very hard to talk about Europe-wide patterns in a short term, in a snapshot form. Um, it is very, very common to read news reports saying things like, Oh, you know, the Austrian Freedom Party, you know, lost 40% of its electorate in the last election. Looks like the tide has turned. Um, I, I'm with you on that first sentence, right? The, the Freedom Party lost 40% of its electorate. That's, that's empirical. The tide has turned. You know, it's, we, we need more hindsight before we get to that place. Um, we know we need more hindsight before we, we know anything about what the longer trends here. Um, so I would just sort of guard again. I mean, I think the, the, the sort of year by year um, electoral results are quite interesting and they often tell us a lot. They don't tell us anything about larger trends. Very often what's going on is, is there's often very local reasons for what happens in a single election. We all know about the October surprise in our, you know, you know, in, in our situation, you know, sometimes it's a, a scandal involving the leader of a political party that makes that party's popularity crash. There might be um, if there's a terrorist incident shortly before an election. Right. So there's often very local kinds of things going on that explain momentary results. Um, but we're interested here in somewhat larger patterns. So let's start out with some definitions here. One framework among many about how to think about the right. This is obviously doesn't just apply to Europe. Um, I'm going to then move us on into think about Europe. But let me just, like I say, for the sake of this talk, um, talk give give a little sense of some possible terminology. Um, the mainstream right. Um, many social scientists will use to speak of conservatives and libertarians within liberal democratic frameworks. Okay, um, far right then consists of those people who are hostile or those parties or organizations, non-party organizations, that are hostile to liberal democracy with two subgroups. One is what's called by some the extreme right rejects democracy, okay? They reject popular sovereignty, reject majority rule, okay? And this is really sort of autocratic rule, um, with, with with no apologies to whether this represents a majority or not. Okay, rejection is the very tenets of democracy. And then we have what some call the radical right, which accepts majority rule, but rejects the liberal in liberal democracy. Okay, so majority rule, um, but if that means trampling minority rights, if that means trampling the rule of law, separation of powers, those kinds of things, right? So it's sort of rejecting the illiberal and liberal democracy. And some people will talk about this as illiberal democracy, 
right? So indeed, popular will, okay, but very a lot of very key tenets of liberalism um, are are considered unuseful by this framework. All right, that discussion, particularly this last group, gets us to um, conversations about populism, right, which is another really important term um, in, in thinking about this. And I'm going to draw here on um, one of the leading scholars of populism, Kas Muda, um, Dutch by uh, birth and education. He now works both in Amsterdam at the University of Georgia. Um, and, you know, as with all things academic, people sort of debate whether, you know, sort of tinker around the edges and think about this. But this is a, this is a useful place to start. Um, a thin-centered ideology that considers society to be ultimately separated into two homogeneous and antagonistic camps, the pure people versus the corrupt elite, and which argues that politics should be an expression of the general will of the people. So let's dig into that just a little bit. Um, <clears throat> the thin-centered ideology... Um, is a kind of a, an implicit comparison to what some would call a thick ideology. Thick ideology involving a kind of a well-defined vision of the nature of society and how should it, it should ideally be organized. Um, so liberalism is, in this context, considered a sort of a thick ideology, a clear vision of, of, of how governance should be. Communism that has, a, has an economic theory that then also explains how politics should work. What happens in practice, of course, you know, all kinds of things can happen, but as an ideology, they sort of purport, fascism would be another one, sort of purport to have some grand vision of how society works. Thin-centered here um, reflects the fact that populism actually, th that's a less important part of populism, that overall vision of how society is organized. And that's why people will talk about left-wing populism and right-wing populism. It can adhere to different, um, different ideologies. So um, we're going to be talking about what's more often called right-wing populism, obviously, for today's, for today's talk. The pure people versus the corrupt elite. The elite is an expansive category. It could be a political elite, a cultural elite, a financial elite. Um, it can be people who, on the surface of things, wouldn't seem to fall into any of those categories. But if they're popular with the elites, then they automatically fall into that category, right? Um, and then there's the, 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 the pure people. And when we have, an, have something like an expression of the general will of the people, that's what we mean. We mean the pure people. We don't mean all the, we don't mean all the homo sapiens, right? We mean people who fall into that category of the people. Pure and corrupt are kind of moral categories. Um, they might in some instances be racial categories, but not necessarily. They're basically moral categories. Um, and they are the necessary adjectives, that is, the elite, the elite is necessarily corrupt and always corrupt. The people are always pure morally. Um, what this doesn't mean, despite the sort of thin-centered ideology business, is that populism can kind of be anything. It is fundamentally in opposition to, first of all, elitism, right, which shares the kind of division of the world into corrupt and elite, um, but favors the elite, right? The elite should rightly rule. Um, the, the common people are, um, you know, the, the, are, are un, unfit to self-govern, right? So there's a, this is all the kind of elite um, common split, but elitism is not really compatible with populism. And then pluralism is the other thing that really is not compatible with populism. That is the notion that society is divided into a broad variety of legitimate social groups, um, you know, with interests that sometimes overlap, sometimes don't, whose boundaries might be fluid, right? This notion of, of kind of a, of, of a pluralistic, a legitimately pluralistic society, that's, that's just not compatible with us. Um, in terms of thinking about a sort of a populist radical right or the notion of an illiberal democracy or what, you know, what here is, is described as the radical right. That's really what we're going to be mainly focusing on here. Um, a couple of key elements in that, what we, that, that, ha that have to do very much with its, its current incarnation are, first of all, um, a nativism Okay, notion that the pure people are defined nationally or ethnically, 
right? And thus the, the very significant presence of xenophobia in these movements. Um, kind of a notion, that I've seen the word ethnocracy um, used in, in some writings about this. That is the goal of democracy in which citizenship is based on ethnicity, right? A monocultural democratic state, okay? Um, as opposed to, for example, the pure people being defined as, let's say, the international working class, right? That would be a, a different way of slicing it, and that is not right-wing populism or a populist right. Um, another common element here is, is a strand of authoritarianism, um, by which I don't mean an, an authoritarian leader, um, more the sort of social psycholo psychological use of the term authoritarian, um, that is a, a belief in strictly ordered society. So clear generational hierarchies, clear gender roles, clear sexual norms, okay? Um, and, and a clearly ordered society that's maintained by a, a fairly disciplinarian education, socialization to respect authority and no one's place, um, a world in which infringements on authority are, are punished severely, the deviation is not, um, not really possible, and a tendency to define problems, all problems, as law and order problems, lack of discipline, okay? A, a, a kind of an, rather than, let's say, diagnosing some problems as having to do with distribution of resources or other problems as maybe related to addiction, right? Um, a number of ways to analyze social problems and the sort of authoritarian, authoritarian tendency tends to focus on sort of law and order. Okay, let's go back now to talk about what I really want to, let's get to Europe finally. Um, we'll go back to that map. We're not going to worry too much about the particular electoral results here. I just want to have a map in front of you because it might be useful for some of you to see a map. What I want to talk about a little bit is both common threads across Europe in the present moment and some regional distinctions. And I'm going to start actually with regional distinction. Of course, what we've seen is just a definition that gives you a sense of some of those common threads. And we're going to come back to later on what that means in the European context. But it is important to re recognize, of course, that Europe actually has a collection of very diverse histories, very diverse you know, economies and, and places, you know, whether they're looking westward, eastward, southward. You know, there's, there's a lot of things going on to create kind of regions in Europe. That means that radical right movements have slightly different emphases and flavors in different regions. So let me start by talking about um, the former sort of Atlantic colonial metropoles, um, right? The Atlantic coastline, sort of think about the other big colonial powers. I'm going to leave Spain out for now. That's a slightly different thing. But really thinking especially about, say, France and the Netherlands. Um, and these are the places that, first of all, do have the longest history of liberal democracy, right? So thinking about the tensions between radical right and liberal democracy is going to be different there than, let's say, a place like Eastern Europe, right? Um, they also have the longer history of immigration from the former colonies, right? Really starting just in a couple of decades, you know, really, in some cases, interwar, but especially after the Second World War. Um, nativist populism here, importantly, often adheres to a liberal language because of the, ten, the, the sort of sense that, you know, of liberalism as part of their heritage, especially around issues of gender and sexuality, right? The notion of, we, as, you know, the West, the liberal West protecting the rights of women, protecting the rights of sexual minorities against purported Islamization, Right? That's a language we see very much in places like the Netherlands and France. Um, now, this longer history of post-colonial immigration, you sort of hear that discussed in two ways. One is a kind of a flattering portrayal or self-portrayal that despite all of their flaws, white West Europeans have had gained some experience living in multicultural societies. And so they handle it better than East Europeans. Right, so there's a little, you know, the West is better at this stuff. Um, you saw a lot of this kind of language around the time of the reunification of Germany, right? This is obviously not an Atlantic empire, but where you had um, you know, a lot of racist attacks in the former Eastern Germany and West Germans saying, we don't do that stuff, right? Um, 
unless for a flattering portrayal is that the Western, you know, European states haven't done the best job at integrating and welcoming um, post-colonial immigrants, um, and that the radical right actually has been a force in these places, certainly since the 1980s with Jean-Marie Le Pen in the National Front in France or with Geert Wilders, um, the Party for Freedom in the Netherlands. Um, so, so there has been this kind of, you know, really xenophobic language and political presence for a longer time in, in, in the places where there's been a significant immigrant presence, uh, particularly a non-white or Muslim presence. Having said that, there was a kind of a sense in that early sort of 80s, 90s, that that was outside the realm of polite political discourse. Those, those, those factors are there, the National Front in France, for example, but they're not going to be part of the parliament. Okay, that is an, a, a, an egregious minority opinion, you know, like I say, sort of outside polite society. Um, today, obviously, there's a little bit of humble pie going on in Western Europe with the sort of mainstreaming of the radical right, right? So, um, you know, like I say, the earlier radical right, if you think about Jean-Marie Le Pen in the 1980s, um, met with massive protests, right? And uh, the 2002 election where he you know, got about 16% or 18%, 16-ish percent, um, you know, alarm went off and there was a runoff election because that's how they do it in France. And um, there was tremendous mobilization. Rates of voter participation went way up to make sure that that he did not do well. Um, and, you know, his, his share declined in the, in the second round. Now you have, you know, the National Fronts in Parliament and his daughter, Marine Le Pen, um, so they had a little replay of that situation in 2017, where she did very well in the first round. There was a runoff, um, and there was great relief when she got only 34% in the runoff. At least she didn't win. Okay, Very different kind of tenor than what had happened a couple of, of decades earlier. All right. Let's turn now to a pattern or, uh, of so the sort of former fascist or proto-fascist states. And here I'm going to focus on Germany and Spain in particular. Of course, there's a lot of overlap, right? Spain's also former Atlantic Empire. Anyway, but still, we're going to do a, a vague type of topology here. West Germany, of course, is a, a really important case. Um, very early and enthusiastic embrace of internationalism, um, enthusiastic backing of the European project um, as kind of a check to their, you know, the sort of a sense that you know, there's value in checking our own worst tendencies, right? We really need to be integrated. Nationalism is a terribly, terribly dangerous thing. Right-wing modelism is a terrible, dangerous thing. We need to embrace nationalism. So, of course, West Germany is <clears throat> very much involved with the European project. Um, in Spain, of course, Franco dies only in 1975. So we have many more people alive with living memories, of, of his brand of sort of proto-fascism, clerico-fascism, fascism, whatever you want to call it. And for a long time, it seemed that in those two states, that experience served as a kind of an immunization, that they were more resistant to the radical right. You know, again, not that there aren't little pods, but that they were more resistant to a kind of a mainstreaming of the radical right because of that prior experience. It turned out that it just made them relative latecomers. Okay, and if you sort of go through go through the the the, the, the calendar, they're they're relative latecomers. Okay, so um, the alternative for Germany, um, you know, has its real has its breakthrough at the federal level in 2017. Okay, it came later than in some other places, but it did come. Okay, Spain's um, party that that sort of tends to fit best in this category is Vox, founded in 2013. It made it into the national parliament last year, right? So the immunization thing held for a while, okay? Nordic states, okay, they actually turn out pretty dark green. Oh, this, the contrast really is not good here. Um, but they, they turn out in the second to highest category in this particular map. Again, taking with a grain of salt because we don't always know how to categorize particular parties. What the, the particular flavor here that's worth knowing about is the extent to which the Nordic states, Scandinavia... <laughs> Um, are defined by a strong social democratic tradition um, and a strong sense of identity with a welfare state. This is what we do best. We do the welfare state, right? Um, and of course, they have some admirers internationally. Why can't we get it like, right like the Swedes do, right? Um, 
Well, and, you know, and of course, and sometimes in those conversations about how is it the Scandinavians manage this and other states don't, one element that sometimes comes up was, well, maybe that sort of thing works better in a more homogeneous society, right? Um, if you're outside that in a place like France or the United States, you might sort of say, no, 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 no excuses. We don't get to, you know, not take care of, of our community members just because we're not homogeneous. No excuses. Having said that, What's happening in the Nordic states would suggest that there might be, you know, that there's something to that. Um, not only do we have this turn now in Sweden, you, some of you may know this, that with the, the 2015 wave of refugees and immigrants um, from Syria and Afghanistan in particular, um, in terms of per, you know, per capita, uh, Sweden took in the most. Okay. Um, still, in terms of the overall population, more homogeneous than, than, than most states further south. Having said that, there's a sense of tremendous change and rapid change. Xenophobia in Scandinavian states is very often framed as, um, or described as a kind of a welfare chauvinism, right? Or a welfare nationalism with a real, real sort of underscoring of this notion that yes, we're a welfare state. Our responsibility is to our community. Of course, in fact, defined ethnically. This is obviously a phenomenon we see elsewhere as well, right? Who's the deserving poor? Who's the undeserving poor? But it's important to understand the, the, you know, the, the balance tips a little bit, right? And in Scandinavia, this notion of kind of welfare chauvinism is more central than, say, languages connecting to po liberalism in light of post-colonial immigration, right? Which is not really part of their history in the same way. The Southern Rim states... Um, the poorer states of Western Europe, right? What's something that's described as the pig's state, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain, right? Um, <clears throat> what's important here is the relative poverty and the 2008 financial crisis in particular, right? And the very alarming situation, both from the outside and the inside of Greece, with a financial crisis, um, the fiscal crisis, the possible collapse of currency, threats that the euro might not hold at all, um, having the, the debates about whether the EU can simply impose very severe austerity measures in order you know, to, for Greece to have permission to stick um, with the European currency. And of course, in light of that, other states that were really teetering with the 2008 financial crisis, and that is especially the Southern Rim, had reason for alarm, although it never really quite got there. Um, the level of austerity and unemployment is an enormously important factor here. And so here you start especially to have this kind of wave of anti-EU sentiment in that context, who are those bullies to the north who are telling us, you know, to slash our, our retirement pensions, right? Um, so the, the anti-EU sentiment, the sense that the more, the wealthier, the more, the richer states further north are imposing austerity on the south and, and the, the sort of feeling of threat means that this anti-EU stuff in the financial context is very, very important in the early, early waves of this language. Now, given their geography, this also, the southern rim here on the Mediterranean, is also going to be the first point of entry for a lot of immigrants and refugees, right? Um, so so they're, they're, then there's a kind of a layering, uh, especially with 2015, um, of of layering of anti-immigrant, and of course it existed before, but here I want to really emphasize that the EU and the financial crisis are very important in how they initially enter this this world, how it becomes sort of mainstream. And then there's Eastern Europe. Okay, I have a lot of notes on Eastern Europe. Um, Eastern Europe, there the the multiple layerings of history all have their impact. Prior to the Second World War, Eastern and East Central Europe and Southeastern Europe were the most multicultural parts of Europe, right? Least homogeneous compared to, let's say, a place like France or the Netherlands. Um, they're ethnically, religiously, linguistically very diverse, even within individual countries, never mind across the region. This experience is not remembered fondly. 
Okay, and realize there's many layers of this. There's kind of movements for you know, national autonomy prior to the First World War against the Austro-Hungarian Empire or the Russian Empire. There's the interwar period where you have newly independent states and the League of Nations is watching to see how they deal with minority rights. Then you have the Nazis and the Soviets, right? You know, let's start with the Nazis, right? So you have this, and, and, and then you, through enormous violence, both with the Nazi occupation and then with the Soviet reorganization of populations, an enormously violent process of ethnic homogenization, okay? So Poland, for example, pre-war Poland is about two-thirds ethnically Poled, Polish, okay? Today's Poland is about 99% ethnically Polish, Okay, really a radical change. And like I say, despite the violence of that process, the intercultural, the multicultural past is not remembered fondly. It was remembered, it's remembered as a, a source of trouble and something that then did lead to this tremendous violence. Um, the communist period um, is left a legacy of a kind of a, a, a feeling of cynical forced internationalism by the Soviets, right? Something that's experienced as military occupation and repressive governance in the name of international solidarity of the working class, okay? So a sort of a notion of internationalism gets a really bad flavor, um, for East Europeans during this period and sort of moments of his heroic resistance, Hungary in 56 and Prague in 68, um, are very much movements for national sovereignty, right? Certainly as much as any particular, you know, economic program. They're very much movements for national sovereignty. Um, so compare that, the sort of notion of what they're coming out of and the notion of national resistance to occupation, compare that to the German experience of wanting to embrace internationalism, right? And, you know, nationalism has a very bad name. In Hungary and Czechoslovakia and Poland, nationalism is a really good name because, you know, first you had to overthrow the Austro-Hungary, the Habsburg monarchs, and then you had to get rid of the Nazis, and then you have to overthrow the Soviets, right? Nationalism is the language of liberation. Okay. Post-communist, of course, there's an immense yearning to join Europe. It's more prosperous. Freedom of movement is enormously attractive. People want to be able to move around. But the cosmopolitan values of Europe are often in tension with the sort of nationalist primacy in, in the sense of sort of freeing themselves from foreign domination. Um, this is exacerbated by what East Europe experiences in the couple decades after, leaving aside who's actually running the show there, they experience an emigration crisis, right? People leave, you know, now freedom of movement, West Europe is richer, huge numbers of people vacate Eastern Europe and move West for education, for jobs, whatever. Um, and of course, they're disproportionately young people. Um, an extreme example would be Bulgaria. About this, I think The data I have is from 2011, where somewhat over 2 million Bulgarians out of a total population of 7 million are living abroad. Okay, so there's enormous anxiety about the sort of the future of the nation. Who's going to read Bulgarian literature in 100 years if all the young people are moving to France and they're going to raise their kids as French speakers and they're never going to come back, right? What this means is when you have things like immigration, which might promise to solve certain economic problems of an exodus of young people, Immigration actually only exacerbates that sense of, of kind of existential melancholy for the nation, is the, the way one scholar puts it. Um, this, and if, if the, the language of replacement has, has some element of truth any place, this is where it is, right? Young people moving out, immigrants moving in, an economy can function, but if the idea of a nation and a language and those sorts of things are, are enormously part of, important part of your identity, this is a real challenge. Okay. The anti-cosmopolitanism that in this kind of environment arises in Eastern Europe links especially well to anti-Semitism, Right, not only because of historical anti-Semitism and that sort of thing, but because 
of the Western language of protecting Judeo-Christian values against Islamization, right? Now, whatever you may think of the term Judeo-Christian, that language um, and the notion of kind of Europe sort of imposing norms that are anti-nationalist on Eastern Europe, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a difficult complex there to kind of unravel. Anti-cosmopolitanism in this context also links handily to opposition to what the radical right in Eastern Europe calls gender ideology. Okay, um, this is not a term that that feminists um, in Eastern Europe use about themselves, but gender ideology, which is experienced as a Western import, um, means disrupting family formations, right? Alternative fam- forms of family formations. It means disrupting traditional gender roles as they understand them. Um, it means disrupting sexual norms as they understand them. And certainly languages of, um, of queerness that threaten dualities, that threaten binary thinking of any kind, is, is really problematic here, right? This is going to be a real challenge. If there's an us and a them, if the world is made of clear binaries, the sort of the notion of queering, um, the notion of multiple family forms, as well as, um, you know, m- multiple ways of thinking of other areas of gender organization is going to be really important. Um, in uh, Hungary is actually a very good example of this, where the attacks on, you know, some of you may know that there's a you know, Central European University, which is a post-communist creation in Budapest with the idea of creating a really cosmopolitan educational you know, university experience um, in the heart of Central Europe, uh, drew, drew you know, globally, but especially from all areas of the Europe, the ideas pe- young people would meet, they would learn together a very progressive kind of curriculum. Um, that, of course, and linked to George Soros, who, who has played an important part in financing it. When in the recent decade and a half or so, the now radical right um, political forces in Hungary started to attack Central European University, they first went, on, went against gender studies intently for years before they then expanded to their more general attack on Central European history. Gender ideology, gender studies in, in what they understand to be a Western import, but the radical right is, 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 um, is important here. Okay, so we have a few different kinds of strands that mean the flavor of radical right um, Parties and non-party organizations is a little different from place to place. What are some of the larger themes that we could talk about um, at the present day? One is collaboration. <laughs> um, it's really hard to imagine in the 19th century or the interwar period, it's very hard to imagine Ger- the German radical right and Slavic ultra-nationalists collaborating on much of anything, right? They had nothing to say to each other, Right? They are absolute enemies, right? Now, various sort of nativist or radical right European parties actually agree on a lot. They agree that the bureaucrats in Brussels are to be despised. Whether you're a Polish nationalist or a Greek nationalist or Swedish nationalist, you know to complain about Brussels. That, the Europe is the enemy. That's one enemy. And the other thing that you know to complain about with your co-radical rightists across several borders is that you don't like it when African taxi drivers pick you up from the airport, right? There is obviously a kind of a whiteness, a Europeanness thing that does underlie the sort of very sort of national specificity. Um, there's a lot of coordination collaboration, um, not only among radical right groups across Europe, um, at the party level, but also in realms like social media, right? Um, and of course, collaboration with radical right movements elsewhere, with radical right um, organizations in the United States, in Israel, right? There's a lot, there, there's, there's collaboration, which, like I say, in older days of ultra-right nationalism would have been just very hard to conceive of. That's one thing. Okay. In some ways, I want to say that Brexit is kind of an interesting case here um, in that it was as much about, Brexit specifically, as much about 
Polish laborers as it was about Syrian refugees, right? So, so again, there's, there's some fuzziness here, um, but the, lar the larger patterns are important. Um, the other thing that is enormously important to, um, is the larger context of political alignment in Europe period. Part of the reason radical right parties are experiencing successes is because there are wide open doors for them to walk into. Um, the complete free fall of social democracy, of social democratic parties, or in Britain, labor across Europe, is, is I mean, this is an absolutely consistent thing. And, you know, they're each different countries. They each go from 1998 to 2018, but a 20 year period you know, like I say, social democratic parties are really in free fall across Europe. Um, that obviously creates an opening. Um, the center-right parties, um, so, you know, the Tories, Germany's Christian Democratic Union, so the traditional center-right parties are increasingly hanging on by absorbing elements of the radical right, Right? So a big picture we see here is, first of all, what had been several decades, and here I'm really talking about Western Europe. Eastern Europe, of course, single-party system for all intents and purposes until the 1990s, and they are, with the fall of communism, automatically going to have lots of parties trying to get a foothold. But especially in Western Europe, for several decades after the Second World War, you had a small number, two, three, maybe four, kind of legacy parties that jockeyed for a position. Okay, what you have over the last, and then you know, the, uh, when the Greens start to make a, a, an appearance in the 1980s, it's an extraordinary moment. It happens once a generation that a new political movement really makes it into the political mainstream. Now, what you have is a constant creation of new parties falling apart, mergers, renamings, rebrandings from one election to the other, whole new parties show up on the ballot. Okay, enormous instability. Um, the mainstreaming is, uh, the, the, the language of mainstreaming is, I think, the, the thing I want to finish up with today. Um, the conversation that, um, that is really important now about how to understand what seems to be a mainstreaming of the radical right goes in two directions. Um, and this, again, is one of the kind of common patterns on the one hand, political parties and political figures that formerly would have been basically kept at completely at arm's length, right? Um, they are not, like I say, not fit for polite company, right? Not fit for participation in parliament, not fit for participation in the political scene. Fringe, what formerly would have been, parties that would have been fringe are now in parliaments and sometimes head of state, okay? So radical right parties mainstreaming into political systems. The mainstreaming goes in the other way in the sense that, like I say, many formerly sort of center-right parties are themselves absorbing elements of radical right um, platforms or ideology. In other words, the substance of radical right movements is being mainstreamed into parties that themselves have long legacies of being with a kind of a mainstream right. Um, this is actually a good place to return to our first slide um, because, well, there we go. This is what's happening with Poland here, right? Um, the first slide counts only this rather fringe party, the Confederation with six plus percent of the vote, and that's why they are a fairly light green the bar graph over here includes the Law and Justice Party, right, which had been a kind of you know, a conservative party, which, however, by statistics reckoning, is a radical right party at this juncture. All of us, this I think, leaves us with the with the pretty profound question of whether the current dire threat to liberal democracy is still from outside the system or whether the threat is now internal, whether the threat is now built into, into the system of party politics as we now have it. 
that's where I'm going to leave you on that pleasant note. I was uh, talking with a colleague about reading um, materials on on this stuff by by journalists, by political scientists, by historians, who um, who have a pretty sobering story to tell. And then the last couple of paragraphs, they try to come up with something to give you hope. And I sort of imagine the editor shaking their finger over them and saying, you've got to give people hope in the end. So say something. And it seems very tacked on to me. Having said that, I, you know, I think that, I mean, obviously we're in the middle of this moment, this pivotal moment of history. So I'd like to open things up for questions now. Thanks very much for sticking with me. Now, I guess I would like to I would like to uh, use my prerogative as host and ask uh, a kickoff question. So, um, uh, Lisa, you talked about the changing uh, popular vote uh, structure and presumably people's uh, receptiveness to uh, the uh, far right uh, parties has, has changed over time, and that accounts for the voting results and other things you showed. At least in the East European context I'm more familiar with, once one of those uh, radical right parties gets enough power, they start um, uh, tearing down the institutions of democracy as well and uh, putting clamps on the judiciary and other things that might uh, allow later uh, the uh, pendulum to swing the other way. So I'm wondering if that is now something that may happen uh, outside of Eastern Europe as well. Yeah, that would have been the one way it could have made things yet more bleak. Talk about what happens once these people get into power. Um, but yes, indeed, and right now, sort of Hungary and Poland are kind of the poster children for this story, um, in that you know, basically both. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work with the bar graph here, not the map. Um, but both, um, you know, in the governments, in the hands of. Um, of parties and individuals who are basically on the radical right, basically sort of opposed to, you know, the liberal and liberal democracy, right? They certainly can claim to represent the people you know, as they define them, and they have, you know, popular support, although often not technically majority support, yeah, mind technically, but be that as it may, you know, in coalition systems and parliamentary systems and systems of charismatic um, leaders, you know, running parties, um, what happens once um, once radical right organizations have an opportunity to govern is they do tend to start dismantling um, the the machinery of government. That that you know one of the as one of the features of sort of liberal machinery of government is that it allows for self-correction in a way, right? If you have an independent judiciary, certain things can happen. If you have um, an independent media, certain things can happen. If you have fair and open elections, certain things can happen, okay? If you start to chip away at that stuff, then, yeah, you start to move towards, you, you, can't, you can't get people or parties out of office. Um, a question about, and, and this, this is what we've been seeing in both Hungary and Poland, basically, changes in the nature of the judiciary. So the judiciary simply is no longer independent. Media is no longer independent. You know? And then it does become very hard to dislodge um, radical right parties in power. Well, how about elsewhere? I think that... that um, the, an intermediate step, when we talk about um, mainstreaming, let's say, in, in Western Europe, and here I'm going to conclude Germany in Western Europe, um, we talk about mainstreaming of radical right ideas, let's say, being absorbed into the, uh, the, the kind of mainstream conservative, the mainstream right, right? So the Christian Democratic Union, for example, in Germany, um, or you know, those kinds of parties, um, the Tories, right? Um, what that tends to often mean, before we get to Poland and Hungary, is other elements of the liberal, in liberal democracy being chipped away at. That is not yet fundamentally changing structures of government, like an independent judiciary, but chipping away of things that are related to um, rights of minorities, for example, 
right? Minority rights are a critical element of the liberal in liberal democracy, right? That's why the Jim Crow South might have been democratic, but it certainly was not a liberal democracy. Yeah, you might have an, a, a, you might have a simple, a, you might have a majority that totally approves of completely disenfranchising a chunk of the population. Well, it's democracy, I guess. It's not liberal democracy, right? Um, so that's where um, people are kind of looking at, at, at what at Central European, well, really Western European countries. Where do you start to see? Um, chipping away at minority rights. And of course, the first place to the easiest place to go is minorities who don't yet have full citizenship, right? So minorities who, you know, immigrants, right? Well, they aren't indeed citizens. Um, in other ways, I mean, they can be, might be, they are, you know, might be conceived of as part of a moral community, part of an ethical community. Then they don't have citizenship, right? So it becomes easier and easier to, to push that. But certainly, um, we see instances, you know, think about, you know, France and the whole burkini business of a few years ago, right? Um, measures to um, strip religious minorities of the full range of ways to dress themselves, right? Wearing a veil, right? Th those sorts of things. So chipping away at minority rights is a kind of a a space in Western Europe where we see chipping away at liberalism, the liberal and liberal democracy that is not yet the eradication of an open judiciary, right? Um, so, you know, again, future remains to be seen, but I think there's some stuff going on there that needs to be talked about. Okay. All right. Um, where does rhetoric on the internet, such as on places like Reddit, YouTube, and 4 slash 8chan, play in the rise of the far right in Europe, especially in regards to anti-feminism and trends such as tradwives, tradewives, and radical traditionals? Okay, so there's, here we have a kind of a, a meeting of a discussion of social media <clears throat> and specifically the gender issues. Um, and anybody who's studied social media, especially sort of hate speech and harassment on social media, knows that this is a highly gendered phenomenon, right? Um, women are much more um, vulnerable to doxing. Women are much more vulnerable to... Um, to campaigns that begin on social media and then gallop over into face-to-face -face personal threats at your, you know, address of residence. Um, social media is, of course, really important in this, and this is one of the most, this is one of the reasons for, one of the ways that collaboration happens now across national borders. It partly happens across national borders because it can, because the central Euro issues are no longer how much the Germans hate the Slavs and the Slavs hate the Germans, but rather you know, anti-immigration type of sentiment. Um, so, so that's one thing that's going on. But the other reason that there's more collaboration now is it's just easier to do it. Right, um, and social media certainly has been important in enabling that, um, and the ability to kind of hide identities, to move around anonymously, to sort of hide your your trace, hide your steps, um, and and spread some pretty vicious stuff on social media is important. I had a slide here that I took out about social media because I just sort of thought I'm going to blow past my time too much. But there was an interesting study done a couple of years ago uh, about Spain um, that sort of traced Twitter users' um, networks. And then these are Twitter users who clearly were sort of, you know, identifying with either Catalan separatism or sort of far left extremism or far right extremism here, meeting Vox. OK, the Vox party and, you know, how these 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 people create these kind of interesting images, <laughs> um, you know, use, using big data. What came out of that study was that, of course, as we know, in all of social media, there's um, a, lo a lot of stuff. First of all, there's a kind of siloization effect, right? So the networks were that people who were fans of Ox talked to other people who were fans of Ox, and they didn't get much news from anywhere else. But the other thing that was really interesting is we know there's kind of like hyper users and super users, you know, some of whom, you know, often they're just bots. But they, what they did is they sort of traced, you know, um, handles that posted, uh, you know, more than 54 postings a day. That either means somebody who's just got no life, right? like, like this is what they do. And I don't mean a pathetic person. I mean, this is their project, 
I mean, this is their project, or it's a bot, right? Um, and of course, those, those, that means a very relatively small number of people have much greater influence because their stuff goes out. And then, of course, it gets retweeted and so on and so forth. That kind of hyper user activity was notably more intense on the radical right than in the other siloed groups. So that's, that's something worth knowing about. There's a kind of a savvy use of social media going on um, that many of us don't think about. It's not just a matter of you know, the silosation we know about, but the notion that a smaller num- a smaller-ish number of people can really be driving things you know, um, is, is important here. Um, and again, the, the gendering of that process, you know, that business, sort of finding people to put up as most hated figures – on grounds of gender or sexuality or gendered behavior um, is a really central theme in all of this. And I, I suspect that's also related to the collaboration across borders that you talked about before. Yeah. <laughs> um, we only have time for one more question. There are a bunch of other good ones we won't be able to get to, unfortunately. Um, so this question asks you to talk about the radical right in potential EU accession states uh, like those in the Balkans. Um, are they more likely to uh, fight off uh, the radical right because they're trying to uh, enter the European Union, or are they actually just a place uh, that's very ripe for recruitment right now? You know, um, when... Historians of the EU look back at the kind of wave of ascensions, you know, following the collapse of communism, right? Um, in the early 2000s in particular, there's a this conversation about what's the cart and what's the horse, right? That is, does a state have to be at a certain stage of economic health to be part of the Eurozone? And do they have to have certain guarantees of liberal democracy, to accede to the EU. And there's some interesting um, discussion about EU membership not as a reward, so to speak, or an acknowledgement that a state has already arrived, but rather as a way to pull them into the club to then be able to have them on the inside so then they could exert more pressure and socialize them better and do all those things that cosmopolitan Europeans, you know, in the EU feel that, you know, they have lessons to teach East Europeans about how to be a good liberal democracy. Um, The consequence of some of that is that, you know, we have states that, that are, that came in that, you know, one had, you whatever liberal democratic traditions they had were by necessity relatively short-lived, right? Because they'd only emerged from communism, you know, a decade or some, a few years earlier, Um, which is a question people ask now about Poland and Hungary, right? At the time of a session, they seem to check all the boxes, but they slipped pretty quickly. Um, so I think it's an open question. Of course, the EU now is a very different place than it was in the 2000s um, when, when the, the, the couple of, you know, sort of post-communist waves of states were admitted. And I think there's, there are um, a lot of you know, the variables are quite different. One is that, first of all, anxiety about the future of liberal democracy is perhaps heightened as opposed to that very optimistic post-communist moment, you know, that liberal democracy has just carried the day, very optimistic moment. It's very different now. But another difference is now the EU is bigger. So the number of states debating and voting on admitting new numbers includes Poland, includes Hungary, right? So it's a little, it's a little hard to know, right? But I, I think that the nature of those debates, um, it, 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 it pulls us to exactly some of, these, some of these really important issues and also the extent to which the constantly shifting ground makes it very hard to figure out where this is all going. <clears throat> Great. Well, let's get, give Professor Elizabeth Heinemann a round of applause. Thank you. It was very, very uh, helpful. Uh, let me uh, uh, thank our sponsors once again, the University of Iowa Honors Program, the U of I Public Policy Center, the Stanley U of I Foundation Support Organization for their continuing genuous support. Also today's special sponsors, Alan Swanson, Blank and McCune Realty, and Maureen Braddock. And thanks again to City Channel 4 for their efforts. Uh, Lisa, as a small token of our appreciation, let me present you with our coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. I'm delighted.